It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The government announced deep cuts to education that will strip a billion dollars out of our kids' classrooms over the next four years. Instead of investing in our schools to tackle the $16 billion school repair backlog or ensuring children with autism have the supports that they need to thrive at school, the Premier's cut will mean 10,000 fewer teachers and more students squeezed into crowded classrooms. Why does the Premier think our kids' education is not worth the investment? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, what we're doing, we're actually modernizing Premier. the school system. We're actually... I am so proud of what the Minister of Education did, revamping the education system. A plan that won't cost one teacher their job. Not one single teacher will lose their job because after 15 years of liberal Order. nonsense, testing out failed ideology for our kids, yeah. letting mass scores fall to the lowest in the entire country. I know the leader of the opposition is all right with our grade six math students. Half of them are failing math. Yeah. One third of our teachers are failing the Fox. same test. But we're fixing that problem because we know we have the greatest teachers in the world. They just need the support that they haven't had in 15 years. Start the clock. Supplementary. Well, I can assure this premier that most of us thinks most of us think there is nothing modern about him or the backwards way that he's taking this province. In just four years, Speaker, there will be 10,000 fewer teachers in our schools because this government's cuts to education. The, in high schools, as many as one in every five teaching posts is in jeopardy as class sizes balloon and students are forced to take classes online, taking classes online instead of in-person instruction. That means less than one-on-one -on -one attention for students and teachers that are stretched even thinner. Why is this Premier choosing to balance the budget on the backs of our kids? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, we consulted with over 72,000 parents. Over 72,000 parents told us what was important. And unlike the previous government, we actually listened to the parents. And what they told us, 95% of the parents do not want their children to have cell phones in the classroom. Those are staggering numbers. The students will not have cell phones in their classrooms. We're ensuring that health and physical education are taught at an appropriate age and that the most important people to teach them are their parents. We're increasing the focus on skills training on math, scientists, and financial literacy because I know, my friends, in this room, there's some people that don't understand finances. Some people don't understand budgets. Some people can't put a budget together. Some people miss that work in school. But I can tell you, we're going to have the brightest students in the entire Stop the clock. Order. Opposition, come to order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Education refused to rule out future changes to full-day kindergarten that could see fewer teachers or early childhood educators in those classrooms. Instead, she said, and I quote, there's no stone unturned at the sta this stage of the game. We're reviewing all of our options. Speaker, our kids' education is not a game. That's it's right. not a game for the government to play. Our kids' education is important. It's important to them now. It's important Turn, to their future opportunities, board. and it's important to us as a province to be competitive. That's what the importance of education is. They obviously don't know it. Will the Premier commit right now to keeping full-day kindergarten the way it is? Members, please take their seats. Questions to the Premier. As I said in my earlier comment, 
We're going back to the basics. Going back to the basics on math, sciences, making sure reading, writing, arithmetic, something that we forgot over 15 years. But again, Mr. Speaker, we are here to support number one. I come to order. Number two, please cream your cake, Okay. Stop the clock. We just got started. We've got 55 minutes to go. The opposition parties have the opportunity to ask their questions, as do all members. Government ministers have to respond. Order. Start the clock. I'm going to ask the Premier to conclude his response. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I can assure you we will never take the advice of the NDP and the Liberals who failed our kids for years and years and years when it came to math. We won't take lessons from the NDP or the Liberals who supported these failed policies for 15 years. We're turning the corner when it comes to education. Again, we will have the brightest students in the whole country by the time our term is up. government side will come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Yesterday, the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston came forward with a disturbing allegation that Dean French, the Premier's hand-picked chief of staff, and other senior operatives within the Premier's inner circle were allegedly engaged in, quote-unquote, possible illegal and unregistered lobbying by close friends and advisors employed by government Premier. side come to order can the premier tell us <clears throat> excuse me if he or his chief of staff dean french were lobbied by individuals not registered to lobby in ontario premier <laughs> through through you mr speaker I, I find this so rich and ironic coming from the leader of the opposition the leader of the opposition just sent a mass email out to all her downtown elite friends, heads of the public unions. And by the way, the poor people and part of the public unions actually that don't support the NDP policies are actually having to pay for these tickets. They sent out an email, come and join the leader of the NDP, Andrea Horvath, for $800. It's an open bar. And you will actually, actually get a reward. That is what it was said in the letter. You will get a reward by having access to Her Highness. The House will come to order. Order. The government side will come to order. I'm going to ask the Premier to, to uh, withdraw that comment. Restart the clock. The Premier withdrew the comment. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Um, there is a difference between legal and illegal, though. That's right. There is. Was the member for. Was the member. Was the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston removed from the PC caucus because he raised concerns about the Premier's Chief of Staff, Dean French, engaging in illegal lobbying activities? That's the Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, once you get to pay your $800 to have access to the leader, this, this celebration, it's called a celebration for being the leader of the opposition and the leader of the NDP for 10 years. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to going to the next celebration for 20 years of her being the leader of the opposition. I will go there myself to celebrate. 
But what, what they forgot, Mr. Speaker, they forgot to follow the rules like they usually do. You're supposed to send out your email blast seven days before, but guess what, Mr. Speaker? They broke the law. They sent it out four days ago, so it doesn't meet the seven-day qualifications. The so why don't you look in your own backyard and clean out your own closet? supplementary. But, you should come well, often, Doug. Well, thank you, Speaker, but I can assure the Premier he won't be invited, so he better not hold his breath. He won't be invited. The member from Lanark Frontac, Frontenac Kingston went on to, to say, order. and I quote, even when the government... Stop the clock. I have to be able to hear the members who are at, asking the questions. It's pretty simple. And I ask all members to allow the speaker to do that. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition can conclude her question. The member from Lanark, Lanark Frontenac Kingston went on to say, and I quote, The member for King Vaughan will withdraw. Stop the clock. I withdraw. The member over here that said the same thing. You have to withdraw. Stand up, member for Brant, Brantford Brant, withdraw. withdraw. Start the clock. I apologize. Leader of the Opposition has the floor. The member from Lanark Frontenac, Kingston, went on to say, and I quote, even when the government is in violation of the law or engaged in unlawful, act uh, unlawful activity, I must accept these decisions as a team member and neither dissent in caucus nor speak publicly of these illegal slash unlawful Question. actions. Was the member from Lanark Frontenac, Kingston, removed from the PC caucus because he objected to the government's allegedly engaging in illegal activity? Premier. Please take their seats. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, in this chamber, we know the only thing that's going on that was illegal was sending out a letter four days prior yep. to a fundraiser. You wow. need to send it out seven days prior to a fundraiser, it's and it's $800 to have access to the leader. No one has to pay to have access to Doug Ford. They just call me on my cell phone. They show up. I'll show up. You got to pay $800. All you have to do is call me on my cell phone. That's the difference. Order. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. Hey, maybe, maybe not on the books. Speaker, my next question is uh, also for the Premier. Come inside, come to order. My, my next question is also for the Premier Speaker. It uh, raises a lot of questions when we have a Premier that was caught participating in fundraisers that were in violation of the law before he was even elected Speaker. Yeah, that's right. And now a senior member of his inner circle accused by a veteran PC MPP of engaging in illegal uh, lobbying activities. Will the Premier tell this House if he has any knowledge of Dean French or his senior staff's involvement in illegal lobbying activities? Just Premier. Well, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has thrown out names, serious accusations. Rather than sitting here cowardly in this chamber, why doesn't she go outside and name the names? Because she knows that she'll be sued. She knows Order. that she will be sued, and that she doesn't have a foot to stand on. It's unfortunate they throw these false accusations here in this protected chamber. Ask the Premier once again withdraw. Withdraw. <laughs> Supplementary. <laughs> Supplementary. Well, Speaker, if the Premier has nothing to hide and Dean French and other members of the Premier's senior staff have not engaged in any illegal lobbying activities, will the Premier then fully cooperate with any investigations the OPP choose to launch? Premier. Again, through you, Mr. Speaker, I find it ironic. I find it ironic that we have $800 cash for access to sit down and have a couple of cold beers with the leader of the opposition. That is illegal, Mr. Speaker. 
You can't be asking for cash for access four days before, sending out emails, going to all her top union buddies and the leaders, because I differentiate between labour and labour leadership, public and private sector unions. I support the frontline people, and I'll tell you one thing, those frontline people do not support their hard-earned tax dollars going to these $800 a night fundraisers to have a few drinks with the Leader of the Opposition. Next question, the member for kitchener Hespler. So My question is for the Premier. Environmentalism and conservation are key components to the identity of Ontario. And Ontario Order. has already made significant progress. Meaningful efforts of individuals and industry have paid off because of this, and we have already reduced provincial emissions by 22 per cent. Local Ontario businesses like Challenger Motor Freight in Cambridge are taking upon themselves to reduce emissions. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier please share with us why he, along with the Minister of Environment, myself and my colleagues from Waterloo Region, were in my riding of Kitchener South Hespler last week? Questions to the Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the champion of all champions, Kitchener West Hespler, MPP, Amy Fee. She has more courage than anyone in this room. What a true champion for the question. We had a, we had a great visit out uh, in Cambridge last week, Mr. Speaker. We went to Challenger, one of the big, largest freight companies in the country. We went there with the Minister of Environment. We went there with a couple other MPPs. And this is what we heard from the frontline truck drivers. They are terrified about this carbon tax. They know everything in the country will go up in cost because everything gets delivered by a truck. Gas prices will go up. Everything will go up in the household. Taking your kids from point A to point B will Response. cost you more. Going to the grocery store will cost you more, Mr. Speaker. But the NDP supports that. They support higher taxes, higher carbon taxes, higher gas prices. That is their socialist mentality. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, and back to the Premier. It's clear that through great sacrifice and meaningful efforts of businesses like Challenger, Ontario has worked to make significant greenhouse gas emission reductions without a federal carbon tax. Ontario can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and fight climate change without a federal carbon tax. Yet Justin Trudeau is continuing with his plan to force this tax on the people of our great province. So, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier elaborate on what the federal carbon tax would do to the hardworking men and women of this province? Premier. Well, again, th thank you for the, the question from the, the member. We went there. What a positive, positive response, Mr. Speaker. You know, what was even just as, as positive when we heard the job numbers? We have built an environment here in Ontario that people have confidence, owners of companies, small, medium and large, have confidence to hire people. 41,000 new jobs were created the month before, 37,000, the month before, 17,000. Almost 100,000 new jobs were created in Ontario in the private sector. Doesn't cost the taxpayers anything at all. Revenues have went up a billion dollars at the province because everyone in the world knows Ontario is open for business and open for jobs. Come to it. Stop the clock. in the water today. The member for Essex will withdraw. I withdraw, Speaker. Draw. The House will come to order so I can hear the next question.
Start the clock. Member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, in his explosive letter from yesterday, the member for Lanark Frontenac Kingston indicated that his expulsion from the government caucus is a direct result of, quote, raising concerns about possible illegal and unregistered lobbying by close friends and advisors of the Premier. Did the Premier remove the member from caucus because he raised these concerns? Yes or no? Members, please take their seats. The question is to the Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, there's absolutely no truth to any of the allegations that the member from Essex has been accusing people that are totally innocent yesterday and today. You know, the leader, the, the, through you, Mr. Speaker, the member from Essex, he walks around here like he's a big tough guy. He's a real tough guy. He thinks, he thinks he's a big tough guy. Well, why doesn't the, the big tough guy walk outside and make those accusations outside this door if he's so tough? He's not tough. Because he knows. Please take your seat. Mr. Speaker. Response. 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 Mr. Speaker, he knows he doesn't have a good enough lawyer to walk outside those doors. He walks around as a tough guy, but he's nothing but a coward. He is nothing but. Okay. Stop the clock. So I, I wish to advise the House that the intemperate language is getting out of control, and I have no choice but to start warning members. Personal insults are not helpful to the dialogue or the discussion, and I would ask all members to, to keep that in mind in terms of the language that they're using in the context of the remainder of question period. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. I guess we know why the Premier wanted his buddy to head up the OPP so badly. That's, right. That's a telling answer by the Premier. <laughs> Speaker, why? Why? expelling this member from caucus for a trial. And ask the member for Essex to withdraw. I withdraw, Speaker. Include his question. Expelling the member from caucus for trying to speak out is just the latest of a string of revenge plots that this Premier has been obsessed by. Speaker, from Brad Blair to Ali Khan Velshi to the City of Toronto councillors that he could never get along with, this Premier attacks anyone, anyone who steps out of line. So I ask again, did the Premier remove the member for Lanark Frontenac Kingston as a revenge plot for refusing, refusing to conceal? Alleged illegal activity? Yes or no? Yes or no, Premier? Stand up, give us an answer. Members, please take their seats. Premier, come through, through you, Mr. Speaker. Again, the accusations are absolutely ridiculous, and I, I, I find it again. I find it so rich, so ironic that. They're holding an $800 access to the leader, bar, bar uh, free-for-all, whatever you want to call it. Drink all you want for $800, because once you drink all you want, then you have the access, and once you pay the $800. Again, we don't believe in that. We believe in anyone that needs our help can make the phone call and pick it up. We believe in the $25 spaghetti dinners that we've been doing all across the province. We've had great turnouts, speaking to communities, listening to their concerns. And the number one comment I hear, Mr. Speaker, is keep going. Do not deter from what you're doing. Keep moving. And I can promise the people of Ontario, we will keep moving this province forward and make sure everyone prospers, everyone grows, and Thank everyone you. thrives in this province. The opposition will come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Our government came into office on a commitment to create and protect good jobs for the hardworking people of our province. Here, here. We promise to make Ontario open for business and open for jobs, and our plan is working. Last month, 
Ontario led the way in job creation by adding 37,000 new jobs. Wow. In just the last three months, we've created over 95,000 jobs, including many right in my riding of Mississauga Streetsville. Can the minister outline for the House how we are making our province an engine for job creation and economic prosperity? Uh, good question. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Well, uh, thanks very much, Speaker, and thanks to the member. I had a great tour yesterday of a business in the uh, member's riding. You know, Ontario is leading the way in job creation because we finally have a premier and we have a government that understands business. As the member alluded to, we've created a lot of jobs since becoming government. In January, we created 41,000 jobs. And then this month, we got more great news. Last Friday, Stats Canada reported that Ontario was the sole province with a notable employment gain in February. Speaker, the United States, the United States created 20,000 jobs. Ontario created 37,000 jobs. You know what, Speaker? It's a testament to the quality of our workforce, our job creators, and the work that this Ontario government is doing to reduce red Response. tape, lower taxes, make Ontario open for business, make Ontario open for jobs. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. I know my constituents want to see Ontario become the economic engine of Canada once again, here, here. and I know that our government is creating the environment necessary to make that happen. Here, here. We promise to create an environment where businesses can grow, thrive and create good jobs, and we are doing exactly that. I know the minister and our entire team have been hard at work reducing red tape and burdensome regulation. Could the minister please inform how important it is to continue creating good jobs for the hard-working people of, of our province? Here, here. Minister. Thanks again to the member from Mississauga. We had a great tour yesterday with GlaxoSmithKline and her riding, finding out how we can reduce red tape to ensure that they stay here and create good jobs in Ontario. When we made the announcement last week, or Stats Canada made the announcement that we had created 95,000 jobs in the last three months, all the member from uh, the opposition could do, the NDP from uh, Waterloo could do, was shrug her shoulders. We think that 95,000 jobs is great news, Mr. Yeah, Speaker, yeah. for the people. Of yeah, Ontario, yeah. and that's why we're doing everything we can to continue to create jobs so that families can put food on the table, they can send their kids to university and college and make sure that we have the workforce of the future. Our government is continuing to make sure that we have that skills match that works in our post-secondary and, our, and our, our public education system for the jobs of the future. We're going to cut red tape, we're going to cut taxes, and we're going to, going to continue to create jobs in Ontario, Mr. Yeah. Thank you. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education, but before I go to that, the Premier has talked a few times about how he always answers the cell phone. I sat with a group of parents yesterday of children with autism who said they have been calling his cell phone repeatedly and have received no response. Yesterday, teachers, education workers and allies across the province wore black to protest the government's plan to jam more kids into overcrowded classes and rip a billion dollars out of Ontario schools. But as school boards and educators continue to assess the damage of these sweeping cuts, it seems the minister might already be setting her sights on full-day kindergarten, telling reporters yesterday that we are, quote, reviewing all our options when it comes to staffing. Speaker, given this minister's track record, why should parents believe those options are anything more than cuts, cuts, and more cuts? The questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'm pleased to rise in this House and talk about our government's vision on how we're going to make education work for everyone yeah, yeah. in this province. Yeah, yeah. Because we know over the last decade and a half, it completely went off the rails under the leadership of the Liberal government. The Liberal government over 15 years failed our students with experiments and ideology that saw sure. math scores oh. and overall scores plummet. plummet. Sure. The resiliency of students with absolutely plummeted as well, and the confidence in that the parents and employers had in Ontario's education system absolutely plummeted as well. Yeah. So therefore, the narrative that the opposition party is trying to create is quite frankly 
offensive, Speaker, yeah, we're because everything. we're doing what we said we would do. We've consulted, Spons. we've listened, and we're modernizing and building an education system that is absolutely, hey, absolutely going to see success for our students. Hey. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm so sorry the minister is offended, but we are going to continue to stand here every single day and oppose these massive cuts to our classrooms. Speaker, speaker, increases to class sizes, forcing students to take more classes online. Eliminating 20 per cent of teaching positions in secondary schools alone, that's 10,000 fewer adults in our schools and less support for every single student. Small and rural schools are particularly worried about keeping their doors open, and not just the small high schools, but elementary schools too. And We know from hearing from communities and teachers in Renfrew and Arnprior, Arnprior and elsewhere that they're looking at class sizes in elementary schools of at least 32 children. Children. Question. With fewer supports, as school boards continue to struggle with all of these uh, inadequate special needs budgets, can the minister explain how eliminating thousands of frontline jobs in education is in keeping with the Premier's promise to Ontario that no jobs will be lost? Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Speaker, first of all, we need to be crystal clear. Yep. There are no Involuntary job loss None. happening under my watch. No, right. None. Again, come to order. I'm going to repeat that for all our listeners and everyone in the House today. The plan we have pulled together is actually getting good reviews from parents and from teachers and from students. And again, I repeat to be crystal clear so that nobody gets caught up in the ridiculous narrative the opposition is trying to create. No one is involuntarily going to lose their job because we know we have some of the best teachers around the world Opposition and we're standing with them NDP for once for feeling. once teachers know that they have a Member government that's going West, to be standing with them to make sure they have Response. the best learning environment in Ontario and across Canada because again it all comes down to making sure we create pathways thank you next question the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Speaker, when I was coming to Queen's Park uh, very early yesterday morning, I met a cab driver. His name was Jesson. We got to talking. He asked uh, what I did, and then he said to me, Can you tell Doug Ford something for me? I said, Sure. To refer to the Premier by the expression the Premier. Thank you very much, Speaker. The Premier. But he didn't say that. I said, sure. Tell him I have a son who's six years old. He has autism. He started saying his first few words with the help of therapy. On April 1st, he's going to lose that therapy. I don't know what we're going to do. Schools don't have the support that he needs. Tell him my family needs his help. Speaker, we are 12 days away from a little six-year-old boy and many other children losing services their futures Question. depend on. Through you to the Premier, I'm asking, or the Deputy Premier, I'm asking again, will they hit the pause button, meet with families, and work with them? Thank you. The Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thanks very much. I want to thank the member from Ottawa South for bringing this to the floor of the Assembly and uh, to, to bringing Jesse's story here. Uh, I must say the last month has been very emotionally charged for many people across the province. Order. And it's been a very difficult time for many order. families as, uh, as they come to terms with our, our policy. I will say that my parliamentary assistant, Amy Fee, and I continue to consult with families. I have been working with the Minister of Health and well the Mountain, Minister of Education so we can ensure that there are wraparound supports for families across the province of Ontario. I'm going to continue to work with those families. I'll continue to work with the stakeholders in the field, and we're going to make sure that, uh, that where we can make some enhancements, we'll do that. But let me be perfectly clear. The system that we inherited from that member's party was broken and broke. We had to go to Treasury Board not once but Spons. twice in order to get over $102 million to sustain a broken system, and we're going to continue to make historic investments into autism in this province. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker. I'm not going to comment on the response. I'm just going to let it speak for itself. So, through you to the Premier, what the government, what the government needs, what the government, what the government needs to do for these families is to walk their very difficult path with them. And what they're hearing from the minister and the and the premier is, we're giving you money, just go away, you're on your own. And I know that across the aisle, members of the government, there are other members of the government, government caucus, who have met with families, listened to them, and want to help them. I don't know what's going to happen in the Earth government caucus room this afternoon, but I do know we're 12 days away from many children losing the Hamilton things that Mountain, they need. And I know that members, some members of the government caucus have had the courage to do the right thing. Question. So through you, Speaker, will the Premier have that same kind of courage and do the right thing, pause the program, and or sit down with families, yes or no? Yeah. Minister, response. Um, so, uh, thanks very much, Speaker. Look, the previous Liberal government left us with a broken system that did not support 75 per cent of the children in the province of Ontario. We will continue with our plan on April the 1st to clear the wait list so that the 23,000 children— The member for Hamilton Mountain is warned. Minister, please respond. So our commitment to the 23,000 children who are presently on the wait list is to move them as quickly as possible over the next 18 months into direct uh, funding models so they get the service that they need. We have made additional investments in the education system. I'm working with the Minister of Health so we can have stronger standards, and we are open and committed to an, uh, uh, an effective dialogue uh, that is respectful and one that we can move forward on. We, we feel uh, the uh, empathy in our government Response. with families who have been uh, de dealing with with this diagnosis, but our commitment today is to clearing the waitlist in the next 18 months for those 23,000 children. Thank you. Next question. The member for Niagara West. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. As everyone in this House knows, good things grow in Ontario. Under the previous government, farmers in my riding, riding faced burden after burden that made it more difficult for them to produce the local food we all love. Our government is committed to increasing access to local foods by removing redundant and outdated regulations while also implementing exciting new initiatives. I know that increasing sales of local food will create jobs in Niagara West, increase economic growth, and ensure rural communities like mine remain sustainable. So my question is simple. Can the minister please tell the House how the new goal of the Local Food Act he announced this week is proposing to increase local food purchases in the public sector? Thank you. <laughs> minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Niagara West for his question. Yesterday, I was proud to announce that our government has established a new goal under the Local Food Act, which will help the broader public sector increase access to local food in their institutions and daily operations. Public sector organizations, including universities, colleges, school boards, hospitals, long-term care facilities, and municipalities, are being encouraged to serve locally grown, made in Ontario foods, including in cafeteria and to the patients. We've launched new tools, such as the Interactive Local Food Hubs map, that will make it easier for organizations to find and purchase the local food they want. I want to thank all those organizations that worked with us to help identify some of the barriers and red tape that we are making and that we're making and are more difficult, making it more difficult to Response. purchase local food. Our government wants to see the agriculture industry in Ontario expand, and by making these making it easier for those in public sector to increase access to local food. We are doing exactly that. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. Local Ontario food plays a vital role in our province's economy. Local food encourages job creation, strengthens economic growth, and supports our hard-working farmers. It's encouraging to see Ontario farmers, food processors, and distributors coming together to increase the presence of local food in our large market. And I look forward to seeing more food grown locally in my riding uh, across public sector institutions in my community. So could the minister please elaborate on the various initiatives our government is developing to ensure that Ontario food is seen in the broader public sector? Minister. 
Thanks again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. In speaking with stakeholders, it was clear an increasing number of public sector institutions are looking to increase their local food. Some of the initiatives our government is proposing to increase access to local food in our public institutions include new and informative videos to promote local Ontario food, a recognition initiative to help public sector institutions who succeed in achieving their food targets, sharing tracking documents to help organizations set goals and measure their success year over year. I also encourage everyone to look at the Foodland Ontario logo to know they are choosing the good things that grow in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to promoting the good things that grow in our province, and I'm excited about all these initiatives and look forward to continuing working and promoting Ontario food. Response. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, more than half of the approximately 3,700 students in the Thames Valley District School Board who currently require school-based rehabilitation therapy are on a wait list for those services. Some have been waiting years for the occupational therapy, physiotherapy, or speech-language pathology they need to be able to learn. Without additional funding, Funding, many of these students may never receive the essential services they require to be successful at school. Speaker, instead of ripping a billion dollars out of our education system, will the minister commit today to eliminating the wait list for in-school rehabilitation therapy for Thames Valley students? Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I find it kind of rich because when just uh, a couple of days ago, even just moments ago, when we talk about eliminating wait lists, this party opposite loses their minds. Give them what of they course, want. We nuts. want to go. You give them what they want, and they go crazy. For, for Waterloo, so the come to the order. Is, we, of course, are taking a look at what we need to be doing in our classrooms and in our school system. You know, I, I hear from occupational therapies, uh, therapists and speech therapists on a regular basis, and they're providing a lot of feedback. And in fact, I'm thinking of one right now, and she supports getting back to the basics. The, her name is Jenna, and I, if you want more details, I'd be pleased to speak to you about it later, because Jenna was sincere of heart, because she said if she applauded us getting back to the basics in math, Fonts. and she said, don't stop there. We need to get back to phonics. That is exactly what the Janice here, told here. me, and you know what? I certainly thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, eliminating the wait list means adding services, not cutting them. Exactly. The Speaker, the transfer of responsibility for school-based rehabilitation therapy from, children, from health care providers to children's treatment centres was supposed to improve access for children with special needs and ensure seamless support from birth to 18. Instead, what we are seeing in the London area is even less timely service, wait lists that are getting longer and more children being denied the supports they need to learn. Speaker, how does this minister expect students to be successful? at school when they don't have the basic physiotherapy they need to hold a pencil, the basic occupational therapy they need to sit in a circle or use the washroom, or the basic speech therapy they need to communicate Question. in the classroom. Members, please take their seats. Minister. Well, thank you very much. And you know what? What we just heard from the member opposite is more examples and more results of a failed Liberal government and here, how here. this past decade and a half, the Liberal administration failed our students across Ontario. But I'll tell you this, Speaker, we're, going Waterloo, to right. to we're investing in our education program that, and system across this province that's going to work for everyone. We're going to be addressing the success factors that students need in order to feel confident and resilient when it comes to being out in the work, world of work. And, Speaker, I can tell you this. Again, what we're doing is we're listening to our parents and we're listening to the teachers. 
We're listening to the 72,000 people that participated here, here. in our consultation oh, because constructive feedback has just been invaluable. Response. And again, I want to talk about Jenna, who sincerely sent me examples and clips and research that showed not only is do, do, like do parents goal. and occupational. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, merci, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Francophone Minister. Tomorrow is the International Day of Francophonie. My question is simple. Is the Francophone world in uh, Ontario a priority? Yes or no? The Minister of Affairs. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, Francophonie in Ontario is a big priority for me and for our government. Thank you for her answer, Mr. Speaker. But according to what we see, aside for slogans, this government only takes care of its little friends. Mr. Speaker, this government's cuts does not should not be made on the backs of francophones or on the backs of uh, children who have special needs or an education. This government has desperately needed the approval of a, a former conservative prime minister uh, to justify uh, this minister this uh, francophone minister's actions so my question to her what are uh, the tangible measures that you will do be doing uh, to increase the support for the ontario francophonie of course, the Ontario francophonie is very important, and our government is working every day for the Fran Ontario francophonie. The Liberal ha had 15 budgets to support the francophones. It had 15 budgets without uh, long-term support. We work every day to make sure that we support our francophone enterprises and we are working on health reforms so that we can improve the access to health care for francophone people. And I'm working with my colleague as a francophone. I continue to improve the justice system in French. We are different from the Liberals because we're doing it in a, with a long-term vision. The next question is the member for Oakville North, Burlington. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that is committed to being more efficient while improving service delivery. Here, here. That means reviewing old systems to find what is and what is not working. We are delivering on this commitment through the Regional Government Review currently underway. It is putting the people of Ontario first and making sure they are getting the services they need in the most effective way. Last week, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing had some great news to announce regarding the review. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister update the House on the status of that review? Good question. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the member for Oakville North Burlington, uh, not just for that excellent question, but also for her tremendous advocacy Absolutely. in her riding. Uh, speaker, uh, I want to be clear. The goal of uh, our government's regional government review is to make sure that regional governments are working harder, 
smarter, and more efficiently. The review is focused on those eight regional governments and also the county of Simcoe and their lower tier municipalities. Last week, as the member notes, I was pleased to announce the launch of the online consultation for our government's regional government review. The participation from people who live, who work, and who spend time in those municipalities covered by the review is going to be vital for the recommendations that my two uh, special advisors will provide me this summer. So I encourage Response. everyone who lives and works uh, in those regional areas to share their thoughts at ontario.ca forward slash regional government. All right. I like that. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. The constituents in my community of Oakville, North Burlington, are excited to have their voices heard by this government. After 15 years of neglect and lack of consultation by the previous Liberal government, it is a refreshing change to be able to provide input and know it is valued. It is an honour to be part of a government that is looking out for the people of Ontario and is committed to restoring trust and accountability in our governments. Can the minister please explain to the House how those who live, work and spend time in the municipalities covered in the review can participate? Minister. Well, thanks, uh, Speaker, and I want to again thank uh, the member for that very important question. She is absolutely right, Speaker. The previous Liberal government had a history of not consulting with Ontarians, but instead imposing uh, their changes on municipalities and the people of this province. Speaker. Our government is different. We are consulting, and more importantly, Speaker, we are listening. Residents of the municipalities captured in the review are encouraged to go online at ontario.ca forward slash regional government and share their thoughts about our regional government review. The deadline to provide comment is April the 23rd. In addition, Speaker, to the public online consultation, the special advisors will continue to meet with key municipal stakeholders and members of the public in each region and also in Simcoe County. Details Response. of this phase of Ontario's regional government review will continue and it will be available in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you again for the wonderful question. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. For decades, the provincial government used the Ontario training schools as a place to send troubled youth. At these facilities, youth were subjected to physical, sexual, and emotional abuse on a daily basis. The survivors of this barbaric system have asked the government for an apology or support or other remedies. This government has turned them down, and the minister is actively avoiding them. Will the Attorney General do the right thing and apologize for the abuse survivors experienced at training schools? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, this is a sad chapter in Ontario's history, um, and I wish that I could say more on the topic, but Ontario was served late, last, late in 2017 with a statement of claim, and so as such, uh, it was certified as a class proceeding, and as such, I cannot speak to a, a case as it is a matter of active litigation. I'm sorry. Supplementary. Speaker, as many as 20,000 children were sent to training schools and were subjected to systemic daily abuse. These children were the responsibility of the Crown, and they were failed by their government. For decades, the survivors have lived with the trauma. What they want is an acknowledgement of the horrific experiences that they endured, but instead they are getting silence. Will the Attorney General stop ignoring the training school survivors and instead acknowledge that their trauma is real? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I just previously acknowledged to the member opposite and to this House how difficult this chapter was for so many people in, in our history and for those experiences. But as I've said, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on this. And that is not meant to negate the pain and suffering that so many people in this province have felt and experienced. But unfortunately, I cannot comment any further. So she's the Attorney General. Thank you. Next question, the member for York Centre. Hey. 
Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Our government for the people made a promise during the election to get the people of Ontario moving, and we're doing just that. We value input from our partners and the people of Ontario so that we can provide the best possible transit services. Recently, there's been a lot of questions and attention surrounding the GO buses that were taking off the loop at York University. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the Minister of Transportation for his leadership on the issue and always putting the interest of students first. I also want to thank Metrolinx for their ongoing conversation with York University in trying to find a solution that works for students. Can the Minister of Transportation kindly update the Legislature on the conversations between York University and Metrolinx? Question. The Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from York Simcoe uh, for that question, or York Centre, excuse me, for that question. Uh, he's been a, a strong addition to our team here at Queen's Park, and we, are, we uh, look forward to working together for years to come. Uh, the issue at York University with regarding the GO bus is very unfortunate, but I, I wanted to be very clear with uh, the legislature here that myself, my parliamentary assistant, Kinga Surma, Ministry of Transportation, and Metrolinx have worked very hard to keep the buses on the campuses. However, York University requested that GO buses be removed off the bus loop. Metrolinx intervened and had them stay until the end of January. However, at that time, York University removed the buses and closed the, the loop that they went to. It's uh, only until recently that uh, when their students and faculty complained that Aunts. York University changed its tune and wanted the buses back. However, Mr. Speaker, they've closed down the loop. There isn't safety for the students and faculty to get off. That's what we're focusing on, it's safety for our students and faculty, and we're going to continue to work with uh, Thank you. Speaker, I threw you back to the minister. Thank you, minister, for that response. Um, as a York University alumni, this is an important issue to myself, my colleagues, and more importantly, the students at York University. I know that the Minister of Transportation and Metrolinx have been working hard to find a solution that works for everyone. It's truly unfortunate that the university made a request to remove the buses, only to retract such requests later on. Minister, it is also regretful that the university is not interested in working out solutions for students. I know that there has been much correspondence between Metrolinx and the university, but it is difficult to find a solution when York University cannot offer routes for buses that are a safe alternative to the York Lanes bus route. Can the Minister of Transportation tell us more about what Metrolinx is doing to ensure student interest is at the forefront of these discussions? Minister. Thanks again, uh, Mr. Speaker. And again, uh since I mispronounced it last time, York Centre uh, member for that uh, question again. Um, you know, I just want to set the record straight here on the GO bus uh, because it's apparent some members of the opposition don't have the clear story of what went on in regards to Metrolinx and uh, York University. Metrolinx sent letters to York University with reasonable solutions outlining uh, uh, in the document. However, York University was not interested on working on any of the uh, solutions put forward by Metrolinx for the students. Mr. Speaker, not only has Metrolinx offered reasonable solutions to meet all the needs of all parties involved, they have also offered to reduce fares for those traveling on the new location and transferring to the TTC. Mr. Speaker, the MTO and Metrolinx and myself and Parliamentary Assistant Kinga Surma are willing to continue to find solutions that work for students Response. and the faculty, Mr. Speaker. It's my hope that York University will join us in keeping students' interests safe and keeping the faculty safe as a Thank you. Stop the clock. Thank you. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last year, members of the Black Ontario Public Service Employees Network spoke out against anti-black racism in the Ontario government. They shared their experiences with the former Liberal minister responsible for the anti-racism directorate, and they demanded a moratorium on the suspension of racialized employees until these issues were addressed. Within a week, 52 cases of racialized employees who were suspended or off work were identified. In July 2018, just over a month after the new government came into power, the moratorium was quietly lifted. The government claimed the investigation was complete. Can the Premier please tell the people of Ontario what they uncovered in their investigation that allowed them to believe that they had solved the problem of anti-black racism within the OPS? Premier. Mr. Community and Safety Services. Social. 
Minister of Community Safety, Correctional yes, Services. Th thank you, uh, and thank you for the question. You know, uh, my ministry and my deputy minister have worked have been working very aggressively on the anti-racism directorate. Um, there are many issues that we are reviewing, studying. Uh, there's a lot of inputs, frankly, that we need to review to make sure that we get this right. This is not a, uh, a fast pathway to a quick solution. Uh, we want to study it, get it right, do it carefully, and we're doing that now. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. Jean-Marie Dixon and Hentrose Nelson are both black women who were employed by the Ontario Public Service. They're suing the provincial government and allege that their experiences of ongoing anti-black racism throughout their public service careers has resulted in PTSD. The OPS has admitted that they failed to address the concerns of racialized employees and specified that black and indigenous employees were part of that group. So why did this government quietly lift the moratorium on the suspension of racialized employees, and what is this government's public plan to address anti-black racism? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. To the President of the Treasury Board. Questions referred to the President of the Treasury Board. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to thank the member for the question uh, on this important, uh, very important issue. Uh, discrimination and harassment clearly have no place, and may I repeat, here, here. no place in here. any workplace, right. and I know that the Ontario Public Service is committed to achieving and maintaining an inclusive and respectful workplace. The Ontario Public Service is always striving to foster a more diverse, inclusive, accessible, equitable, and respectful workplace. We have made these values a cornerstone of our, our, our ongoing efforts to transform and modernize government. As this matter is before the courts, the appropriate venue to respond to the specific allegations will be through the legal process. As a result, it would not be appropriate for me to comment on the specific allegations cited by the member opposite. Next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, did you know that the minister attended the 2019 Juno Awards this past weekend in London? I was very pleased to learn that he did attend those very special awards, highlighting music in our province and in our country. Speaker, as you know, the Junos recognize the best in Canadian music, and I was pleased to see another Ontario city was able to host the awards show this year. Events like the Juno stimulate our local economies and bring people in from across Canada to see our world-class cities. Can the minister please, uh, please update the House on his visit to London and your experience, Minister, at the Juno Awards this past weekend. Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Chatham, Kent Leamington, for that question. I also want to uh, congratulate him publicly for the two-time winning uh, 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 Canadian Gospel Award his daughter received this year. Congratulations. You know, Mr. Speaker, it was truly an honour to attend the Juno Awards and the gala on behalf of the Government of Ontario in beautiful London, Ontario this weekend. I, wanted to commend, I want to commend the City of London, its Mayor, Ed Holder, and its residents for making this a great weekend, a great week, but a great weekend as well that I was able to participate in. It was truly an amazing Response. event uh, at the Forest City's first ever Juno Awards. The city was bustling. It was an incredible opportunity to meet incredible people that are contributing to Ontario through the music industry. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'm humbled by your comments, Minister. Uh, my daughter Brooke works very, very hard. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to say that she gets her her music talents from her mother, but she doesn't. <laughs> but don't worry, I, I, I won't break out into song. I, I promise that. 
But again, uh, Speaker, uh, again, I, I think I can speak for all of the members in this legislature that when I say that we're proud of homegrown talent that was on display at this past weekend's Junos. You know, whether it was Pickering's Sean Mendez, who took home five awards, or Napanee's own Avril Lavigne for winning the Juno Fan Choice Award, this year's edition Question. of the Junos showed that Ontario artists are among Canada's best. Can the minister explain to the House the steps that our government for the people is taking to support music in the province of Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again for that supplemental question. I'm pleased that our government for the people was able to provide support for this year's Junos through Ontario Creates, which is an agency that supports the province's cultural media cluster. This includes book publishing, film and television, interactive digital media, magazine publishing, and of course, the music industry. Our government for the people has also invested in other important initiatives that will strengthen Ontario's music industry. We've invested in the revitalization of the iconic Massey Hall, supporting the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, which, by the Response. way, also won a Juno Award this year for recording Vaughan Williams' orchestral works. The sector contributes $25 billion and supports 270,000 jobs in the province. Next question, the member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. The people of Niagara Falls have been promised a new hospital. They've been told that this hospital is coming. We've had not one, but two unveilings of billboards. We're told that the mental health unit and the labour and delivery unit were taken out of a Niagara Falls hospital because we'd be replaced by a new state-of-the-art hospital. If you can imagine, you can go to Niagara Falls and make babies, we just can't deliver them. <laughs> and yet, years later, residents are driving across the region for services they need. There is no reason why we can't put a shovel in the ground on this hospital today. The government is in the process of demantling the LIN, outsourcing those services. How can they also now be planning the necessary services in the new hospital? Can the minister confirm we will not be losing any services? And when, we, when will the first shovel break ground? And when will the residents finally see their hospital go up? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the question. And as the member I'm sure well knows, there are many, many capital projects that are waiting to be advanced in the province. There is a mechanism and a specific process for dealing with that. The, your hospital, as with many others, is going through the process. And when it gets to the point where the, the construction can start, it will. But we have to go through the necessary steps. I know to many people it seems like it takes longer mm -hmm. than they would like it to, but the due diligence has to be done. And that's what's happening with every capital project in the province of Ontario, because we know, as you know, that hospitals cost a, a lot of money, and we need to make sure that there is the need, that there is the ability for the local fundraising to happen, and that the entire project has to be ready in many respects in order to proceed. So Good news. It is progressing, but I'm sorry it's not going as quickly as you would like. Thank you. That concludes our question period. I, I Member for Algoma, Manitoulin, told me he's what point of order. Yes, uh, I always like it when one of our caucus members tries to fly under the radar. I want to wish the member from Brampton Centre a very oh. happy yeah. birthday. Yeah. Thank you, very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to invite uh, or to welcome uh, one of my guests who are here with us today. Jamie Santana is a BCBA and he is a resident of Etobicoke North, and he's with us today in the gallery. <laughs> I believe the member for the Minister for Tourism, Culture, and Sport has a point of order. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I just want to give a quick shout out to Paige Catherine Trimboli that joins us from uh, Vaughan Woodbridge and her mom, who's here today, Christine Fiorini. Welcome to the House. 
Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Kitchener Centre has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services concerning racism in the OPS. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. This House stands in recess till 3 p.m.